Hey, what's up everyone? This is Corey Glenn, and I'm going to be talking about sinus lifts today. So uh, I'll be showing the Crestal Sinus Lift Kit, the, the fully guided sinus lift kit that Blue Sky Bio sells. And this is a case that we did this past week. I uh, went in and helped Dr. Aaron Carmine, who's a good friend of mine and dentist here in town. And uh, we're doing a full arch on this individual and both of the molar sites, the sinus was kind of low. And so we just did some simple sinus elevations, did an excellent job. And I, I'm a huge fan of this kit. I think it makes sinus lifting about as dummy proof as possible. Um, you know, here's the stars of the show. This was a surgical picture. So there's a little blood and stuff on it, but we used the fully guided keyless kit for the majority of the arch, but on those individual sites, we used the fully guided sinus lift kit. And so you can kind of see it here. Uh, and that'll really be the star of the show on this uh, particular video. But, you know, I was always very intimidated by the sinus. Uh, it wasn't something I got a lot of training on in my residency. And it's really not something you need to be terribly concerned with as long as you take a very careful approach and follow some basic rules that I'm going to lay out for you. I got to give a quick shout out to this topic on Dental Town. So Sheldon Lerner, who's one of the owners of Blue Sky Bio, uh, Bio is a periodontist, and he did an amazing thread on Dental Town called the Sinus Lift from A to Z. So I've taken some images and stuff from that, uh, and then I've also done an in-person course with him on sinus lifting. But really great content. I mean, this is a huge thread, so you'll get a ton of knowledge out of this. Much more in depth than what I'm going to show you here. I'm more focused on the guided uh, sinus lift uh, part of the kit. So I'm going to give you just a couple minutes here of quick anatomy and some bullet points of things that you can do that if you'll if you'll follow these instructions you really should avoid the vast majority of problems okay so any time that you're considering doing a uh, sinus lift in general but particularly a crestal sinus lift one of the things you want to do is make sure that when you take your ct that you're getting up high enough with your field of view that you can verify whether they have a patent ostium all right, so what's the ostium? Well, when you look at maxillary sinus anatomy, it's a big cavernous uh, cavity there, but the only exit point for that maxillary sinus is the ostium. That's the hole where uh, debris can get out, where mucus is uh, you know, allowed to exit into the sinus passages. And so we always want to make sure that we've got a patent ostium. All right, it's incredibly important. And I want to throw out there that the average diameter for most people of the maxillary uh, ostium is about 2.4 millimeters. And that's important because it's going to come into play with the particle sizes you choose to use. Uh, you know, if you get particles that escape up into the sinus, you have a perforation for some reason. We want to make sure that we're not using a large particle size uh, like is often advocated for a lateral wall sinus lift. We don't want to do that in a crestal sinus lift because if particles escape, it's critical that those can get out. All right, so you've got to make sure that you've not got particles so big that they can't escape. And if the average is 2.4, that means there's probably a good number that are, you know, 0.8, one millimeter. So if you're using these big uh, spicules of bone, that might cause some problem. And that's really the number one area where you can get yourself in trouble is that should you have a perforation and you put graft or some foreign material up there and now it can't escape, you're really setting that patient up for some problems with sinusitis, long-term infection, might require retrieval uh, from the ENT or an oral surgeon. So we just want to avoid those problems if at all possible. All right, you need to know about these things too. So the wall of the sinus, uh, everything is beating up towards that ostium. All right, so this is like a, uh, a sink in your bathroom. And you know how it has the overflow hole at the top? It would seem like, you know, that that's not the best design for this uh, because all of that material, the mucus or any escape particles, has to beat up the walls against gravity to escape out of that hole. Uh, now, having said that, you might think, well, that's just poor design or whatever. Well, they've actually done uh, surgeries where they, they punch a hole down in the lower portion of it and, and things tend to not go well. So, you know, God's got a design in this. It's uh, important that you do that. But these cilia are all going to beat up towards the ostium 
and carry any particles out of the ostium. Okay, so we want to make sure it's patent and then we want to make sure that we're not using huge particle sizes to do this. And then your other biggest thing is you've got to make sure that the sinus is just free of pathology. When you look at this uh, slide, you see a healthy sinus on the right, but on the left, you see lots of polyps. You see uh, thickened membrane, potential infection. You know, if, if you do a sinus lift here and you inadvertently cause a perforation and material escapes into that sinus, it's got nowhere to go. And now you've got a foreign body reaction in the sinus and you're setting yourself up for some really big problems, okay? So these are my three biggest rules for a safe crestal sinus lift. If you follow these things, you know, this should be about as dummy proof as it gets. So make sure it's free of path pathology, make sure you've got a patent ostium, and then use a small particle size for your graft. This is the patient that uh, Aaron actually treated in this, and you can see in this cross section of the CT that the patent, uh, that the ostium is in fact patent. I'm going to jump into Blue Sky and actually show you where to find that. All right, here we are in Blue Sky Plan, and there's one particular view that you're going to find most useful for this, and it's not in your standard. Uh, view that you probably do all your implant planning out of. If you want to change to it, you can either hit F5 or go up here to View and go to Perspectives, and we're looking for MPR. All right, because this is the the view that we want to analyze here. Okay, so I'm going to maximize this. This is just notice here uh, this line moving back and forth. This is just a frontal slice that allows us to see through both of the sinuses as we go back and forth. All right, so you should expect to see that ostium at the middle meatus up here on the medial wall of the sinus, all right? And as I go through here, I'm focusing on this one, you can see this is a large tract. It's got uh, patency. There's black, which is air, all the way into the sinus passages or the nasal passages. So we're looking good on that one. And then if we look at the same place on the other side, right here, that's your ostium. And you can see that it does in fact track and it opens right there. Okay, it's not perfectly in line with it, but you can see that that does remain continuous. I don't see any pathology. This is a good healthy looking sinus, patient reports no problems. And so this should be a great case to go ahead and proceed with on your sinus lift. And if you are looking to do your first indirect sinus lift uh, using this kit, find a case that doesn't necessarily really need one. You know, the great ridge to do this on is one where you've got eight millimeters to the sinus floor and everything can go poorly and you could cause a perforation and it's still not gonna be detrimental to the case because you'll still have a good amount of implant and bone. That would be the case I would suggest you start with. Uh, and then work your way up because over time, you know, once you're experienced with this, we've done cases with half a millimeter of bone and then you're in the sinus. I mean, we've done some really aggressive stuff where uh, we actually had to two stage it, place a big bunch of bone graft and then come back later. But these crestal sinus lifts are just so much less traumatic, less swelling, less pain. They're just easier in every respect. The downside is you're working blind, and so that's my aim in this video is to show you how you approach that safely, know what you're doing, and if you'll do this, you'll get great results. So again, that was the patient's uh, ostiums. They're open on both sides, and you can see it's not a, a huge lift. We're going to try to get three to four millimeters here on each side. So now with all that out of the way, let's talk about the kits, okay? So if you've used the Blue Sky Fully Guided Keyless Kit, you know that the keys are built into the drills. And with all the Blue Sky Guided Kits, whether it's our standard implant kit or the Guided Sinus Lift Kit, you need to understand uh, just the basic way a keyless kit works, all right? Every drill in the Blue Sky Kits are going to use an 8.5 millimeter offset, all right? Very important that you understand that. What is the offset? So let's just look at an individual implant here. This is one of the anterior implants for her case. So the offset is the distance. If you take a measuring tool, it is the distance from the top of your guide tube down to the platform of your implant. All right, so you can see I'm at approximately 8.5. That's using the standard offset that the Blue Sky Kit calls for. Uh, the software automatically programs it for uh, the setting. And so that is the distance that corresponds to the built-in key on your drill. All right. 
And then beyond that, you're going to have the business end of the drill. So if we were using the 13 millimeter uh, fully guided drill, then you would have eight and a half millimeters of offset, which corresponds to the built-in key. And then you would have your 13 millimeters of business end of the drill. So back on this image, you can see this is a uh, three by 10 millimeter drill. The way these things are set up, there's a built-in stop that bottoms out on your guide tube. The barrel here is six millimeters long, and then there's that two and a half millimeters of transition zone. That's your eight and a half millimeter of offset. And then everything is gonna be the same from here up on all of these sinus drills and osteotomy drills. They only differ now with what's on the business end. So when we look at the sinus lift kit, you should expect to see the same thing. You're gonna have the built-in stopper, the built-in key, a little transition zone, and then your business end of the burr. So these are all the sinus lift drills. They go from two and a half millimeters in uh, length up to 11 and a half. Because honestly, if you've got 11 and a half millimeters of bone, you probably don't need a sinus lift. So we're looking here at this two and a half millimeter initial crestal sinus lift drill. Here's your eight and a half millimeter offset that would be built into the software. And then you've got your two and a half millimeters of working end, all right? That's the business end of the burr. So when you start approaching a case, and let's, let's look at the CT again, then using the standard 8.5 millimeter offset, you can see that uh, that's gonna get us to right here with the built-in key. And now the question becomes, okay, which drill should I expect to be breaking through into the sinus floor with? The easiest way to do that is just use your measuring tools up here. We could go from the top of the tube, again, this is set at 8.5. All right, that should get us right to the platform of the implant. I'm not being real careful to be exact. Now, where will I break into the sinus? Okay, so right there to the sinus floor, you're at roughly six and a half, seven millimeters. So I should expect when I'm going through my drill sequence to break through into the, the sinus with either the six millimeter drill here or the seven millimeter drill, all right? Now, since the, the shortest drill in the basic uh, guided kit is six millimeters. You could just take that one to depth, go ahead and create your osteotomy, even enlarge it in diameter a little bit. But at that point, now you would want to switch over. Once you're close to the sinus, you want to switch over and now use your safe ended sinus drills because these things will cut the hard tissue without damaging the soft tissue. They, they're not going to damage that sinus membrane. So if I was doing this, I would probably take my six millimeter drill to length. That gets me right to the sinus floor. Then I would jump to my seven millimeter sinus drill. I would expect to, per, uh, to break through the sinus floor there, but I don't really know, okay? So I'll, I'll show you how we approach that here in just a moment. So let's look at each of the sites in her particular surgery. So site number 14, this is if you were using the standard offset here, 8.5 millimeters, which the, so the software automatically programs in. All right, so there's your offset. And then here, this is showing the length up to the sinus floor of about six and a half millimeters. So I should expect to break through with that seven millimeter drill. All right, now one thing Aaron chose to do on this surgery is he actually raised his guide tubes up. And that's, a, that's one nuance that you have to understand with any sort of keyless kit. If I now take this tube and raise it up a little bit, well now, that six and a half millimeter drill is not gonna to get to that depth. So in Aaron's situation, what he did is he raised his tube to 10 millimeters. You can manually do that. If I was to run the measurements again though, you know, he's effectively raised his tube a millimeter and a half, and that has effectively shortened every drill in the kit by the same amount, by a millimeter and a half. So now instead of breaking through at six and a half millimeters, he's probably gonna break through at eight. All right, and you can measure that once again, measure from eight and a half from the top of your tube down. And you see now it doesn't get all the way to the implant. All right, so if I pick my measurement up there and run it, you can see it's gonna be eight millimeters where I should expect to break through. And that's just an overlay showing the eight millimeter drill. That's exactly where you would expect this to, to break through at. If we look at the site number three, once again, if you use the standard eight and a half millimeter offset, then we could measure there's to the platform of the implant, that's eight and a half. And measuring again, it's probably in the seven, eight millimeter range where he should expect to break through. 
Now, the reason he chose to raise his guide tubes up is, do you see, this is the outline of her denture, and this was a scan appliance, like denture guide, and the tube is impinging into that a little bit. And so, as opposed to trimming on the underside of it and getting it where the tube doesn't impinge, he just chose to raise it a millimeter and a half. So now, the tube is at 10 millimeter. You see there's no longer any impingement here. Run your measurement again. That's effectively shortened it by a millimeter and a half. So now instead of breaking through at the eight millimeter drill, it's gonna break through at nine and a half. So you would be looking at your 10 millimeter drill. So let's jump back to this image real briefly. Just suppose that we, we've done our measurements, we know uh, what drills we wanna take and what we expect to get us through the sinus floor. But again, this is a blind procedure. You're working in a little bitty hole it's dark up there, you can't see it, and you don't want to go poking up there trying to feel for the membrane because tactile sensation is probably going to lead you to having a perforation. In fact, we used to have a, an instrument in the kits that was made for that, and it would tell you, you know, poke up in there uh, and feel for the give of the membrane. And, you know, what happened was that a lot of sinus exposures got caused secondary to checking for sinus exposures because you just really can't feel that membrane. So I want you to pretend that we, we've done our measurements and we expect to break through at this six millimeter drill, but we don't know if we have. Sometimes there's an angulation to the sinus. You might have a little bone ahead of you. So how do we know? The best and simplest way to do this, and I'll show you this in a moment, is to now, you've, you've done your six millimeter drill, you think you're through. Now just put your seven millimeter drill into the handpiece Take it into your guide and just put it in there all the way, but without running it, or at least barely running it. Maybe just a tiny bit of rotation just to allow it to seat in there without having too much friction. If you do that and that seven millimeter drill goes all the way to depth and the, the stopper on the drill bottoms out on your guide tube, well, what you know is that You've, you've achieved patency with that previous drill because there was no bone ahead of it that made it stop. However, if on the other hand, when you put this seven millimeter drill in, if you put it all the way in, not running, and it bottoms out and there's still a one millimeter gap between your stopper on the drill right here and your guide tube, well, that tells you you've hit a brick wall. There's still a little bit of bone ahead of you. So step on the pedal for a couple of seconds, proceed that one more millimeter, and now repeat with the next drill. So now we think we've broken through with the seven, but let's check it. We'll take the eight not running. And generally what you'll find is that's gonna to go to depth without running. Now you know your patent. And at this point you can begin to lift. All right, so let's, uh, let's look in the video of Aaron doing that. Okay, so this is how you check for patency. So he felt like maybe he broke through with the last drill, which was an eight millimeter. So you would take the next drill, because it is somewhat blind, you don't know if you're patent. So take the next drill, put it in, and without even running it, you can see here it's going all the way to C. So that tells us we're patent, we can do the graft. Okay, so that was on the patient's left side at number 14. Remember, by the measurements, after he had raised his tube, we expected to break through at the eight, and he kind of felt that pop uh, as that eight millimeter drill was going to seat, and that was breaking through this uh, cortical floor of the sinus. But again, couldn't tell for sure, so we grabbed the nine millimeter drill and you saw that without running it, that thing just slid all the way to depth. And the reason that's so critical is that there's no risk that Aaron's pushing on this membrane more than that one millimeter of extra length on the drill. And that's not enough to damage the sinus membrane. That tells him he's patent, now he can begin his lift, all right? Let's now look at him doing the exact same thing over on site number three. Sinus kit, we expected to break through at the seven drill. And so now he's taking the eight and it could be that it goes to depth, but if not, that tells him there's a hair of bone ahead of him. There is. Okay, so you can see there's a half millimeter or a one millimeter gap there. So all I have to do is step on the pedal for a second and take it down. There we go. Open big. And so now just to verify it's patent, we're going to grab the next drill up, this one being the nine. And if it's patent, we should be able to more or less insert this and go to depth without running the drill. And you'll have to work at it a little bit just because you do have some binding on the tube and whatnot. I feel like I'm binding on some bone there. Okay, well then step on it. 
I, I can and just feel it super low speed. Yeah. And if it goes in with almost no pressure, then that was probably patent, yeah. Yeah. and it just was a little tiny so, spicule. So now you can see that's going up and down pretty easily. Open a bit from the eye. So at this point, you could start his lift. All right, so I don't know if you caught that, but I actually, uh, I, I had said we expected a breakthrough at seven, and that's because I forgot for a moment that we had raised the guide tube, and thus that's why it was not going to depth. But again, it's it's so safe if you proceed in that manner. There's no chance that you're ever pushing on that membrane more than one millimeter uh, beyond the sinus floor if you take the approach that I've shown. So. Both of the sinus floors were uh, eroded without any damage to the membrane, and then you can start your lift. Uh, I don't have any images of that, but uh, Aaron used uh, just a freeze-dried uh, allograft, uh, small particle size, like half millimeter. Again, she had an open ostium. And you just start packing that graft. So there's a little uh, carrier right here, like you see in this image. You can scoop up the bone. I like to hydrate it. I'll oftentimes use it with uh, a bone binder, like fusion bone binder or something like that, or PRF is great. Um, and usually we'll follow uh, first with a piece of collar plug. So if I have either PRF or collar plug, PRF is the most ideal material um, because even if you have a tiny pinpoint perf, PRF is going to more or less seal it. It's a big fiber and clot, right? If I don't have PRF accessible, I'll usually take a collar plug, cut it into a half or into thirds. I'll poke those pieces up first to provide a spongy uh, lift to the membrane, kind of a, a cushion on the membrane, and then follow it with my actual graft material. And then when you're packing the graft, you really want to make sure that you tracked when it was you broke through. So in that uh, the last one that I showed, we broke through at nine millimeter. So I would either use the eight or the nine millimeter condenser here. These are also all uh, controlled for with length. So usually I'll take the guide off at that point because it's hard to pack that graft through uh, your guide hole. Take the guide off, poke your graft in there, and then condense it using uh, one of these depth controlled condensers. Because again, you want only your graft material touching the membrane. You don't want to risk poking it and causing a perforation with that. So how did it turn out? Well, here in this image, you're seeing the post-operative CT scan. Okay, And notice you've got these beautiful domes of bone over the top of the implants. You've got one right here. In fact, he placed a lot more graft material on this side. And it's in this one image, you can't see it, but it actually extends you know, well up into here. But, you know, I've done these uh, back when I was clinically practicing and could routinely get, you know, 10, 12 millimeters of lift on it. Here we didn't need that much. The yellow is actually her preoperative maxilla, all right? And it's been stitched in and overlaid into this uh, postoperative CT scan. So the yellow line here was her original sinus floor. And now this greenish line is what you can see is the new sinus floor and we've got beautiful domes. And typically what's going to happen with these indirect sinus lifts, uh, depending on the material and its resorption rate and everything, uh, usually you'll, you'll see that that membrane over time will come down a little bit, but it's going to stay over the top of your implant, and you don't need bone beyond the apex of your implant. Um, even when you do just like a PRF lift with nothing else, just maintaining that space the membrane would come down and it would just drape over the apex here and you would have nice vital bone all in around this. So I did the flip side of that and I also took her post-operative maxilla and her post-operative implant positions where the implants actually ended up. Those are outlined here in yellow and then the red is her post-operative maxilla. So once again you see the exact same lifts here but I thought it was cool to kind of show you where the implants ended up when I turned on the implant positions as they were planned. All right, so everything went in perfectly. The, uh, the guide was taken off to do the lift and the implant just placed in there freehand. So with these large diameters, you can see we maybe had a two degree angle change, uh, but position wise, the depth, all of that is right on track with where we wanted it to be. So very easy procedure. If you'll follow these instructions, you should have no problems with this. 
so again, I hope you found that helpful. Um, don't be intimidated by these things. If you'll follow these, everything should go smoothly. Start on the easy ones that you may not necessarily need a lift and then work your way up and you'll be impressed uh, with how much you can do with this. I, I don't think I ever referred out hardly for a sinus lift uh, lateral wall approach once I became proficient at doing this. So really useful tool if you want to get this kit Go on to Blue Sky's website and under shop online, you can go to uh, instrumentation here and you're gonna see it's the first one in the lineup. And it's got some videos that I've made on this, but uh, again, super useful kit. Uh, we do have uh, an old school one that is for non-guided, but to be honest with you, this kit you can use guided or non-guided, all right? You don't have to use uh, a guide with this because when you look at the way these drills are, are made, you know, it's not gonna be able to drill any deeper than the business end, right? You could use this as a freehand drill and when it bottoms out on that stopper, you know you're at 10 millimeters of depth in the case of this one, right? Because, you know, the, the fatter diameter of the built-in key acts as a bone stop. Um, so anyway, great kit. Hope you find that useful and we'll see you later.